Uh, I'm Dale Ball, and this is Carolyn Beninsky, and we're here today to talk to you about our food choices and our water footprint. And we've had a lot of information here already this morning, a lot about water law and uh, a lot of the problems we're having now with uh, not enough water to go around. And I just want to say, you know, it's only been over a little over a hundred years that water law has even been an issue. Um, before all the compacts, appropriations, diversions, there were animals, plants, living, evolving with the rivers, and none of them were brought to the table when a select group of human beings decided that they had the rights to water. Only the people had rights to water. Even now it's called, what is it called, Joe? The well, the, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, the water belongs to the people of Colorado. And, you know, no birds, no frogs, fish, dragonflies, ecosystems, the rivers themselves. None of that was considered unless they were of use. If they were trout to be fished or maybe hunting along the river, or for some scenic beauty, but the, the animals themselves were pretty much dis and are still disregarded. We're starting to come around. Um, and it's funny, I, uh, I, I wanted to bring a representative of all those communities to the table because they were not at the table to begin with. So I have for you the water oozel is at the table today, <laughs> representing all of the rivers, all of the creatures, all of the plant communities that were not at the table. And I'm on the board with Boulder Rights of Nature, and our whole effort is to, to recognize that other forms of life have a right to exist. It's that simple. Getting it into law, not so simple. So we're on the very edge of recognizing. I, I, I think you know, many years ago, people did recognize, no, you don't fish all the fish out of the sea. No, you don't take everything that's there. Um, but, and I also want to stress that, that these things have a intrinsic value for themselves, whether, you know, our, our grandchildren, that's great, but what about their grandchildren? <laughs> um, so this is made out of paper mache, by the way, not, not a real oozle. Um, and let's see how much, we're a little short on time, and I, I just, and in doing research for this, our water footprint and food choices, Wow, so much information out there. How, what to present. Um, I, the biggest shock to me was that California, uh, the Imperial Valley in particular, has a, gets a fifth of the Colorado River. They were one of the first ones to have a water right. So as far down as it goes, they have a right to it, whereas the Oozle does not. Um, and these compacts were made at a time. They were starting up compacts, allocations, rights, were, were first being made at a time when people thought water was wasted if it just ran on by, if it ran to the sea. We could be using that. We could be putting it to beneficial use. <laughs> um, so now, in the Colorado River helps uh, support a massive dairy industry that California leads the country with. And they do that in part with Colorado water, Colorado River water growing alfalfa in the Imperial Valley. The Imperial Valley gets three inches of water a year. It takes at least 36 inches of water a year to grow that alfalfa there. 
They get that from the Colorado River. The alfalfa is fed to the dairy cows, and, and the dairy cows' footprint, ecological footprint, water footprint, and water footprint, 98% uh, of it is in the alfalfa that they eat that's grown in the Imperial Valley with Colorado water. <laughs> um, that was pretty shocking to me. Uh, and let me, I'm just gonna set out a little poster here that was a little shocking to me. Yeah. And tell me when to stop. <laughs> Actually, this is a good, good time to segue into, I found out that 70% yeah. of water use 70% of water use, any water use, is for agriculture. And about 50 in, in the U.S. In the U.S., about 50% of that water is used for agriculture, or for uh, livestock use, mostly tied up in their in their use for uh, animal feeds, soy, corn, alfalfa. So that's, uh, that's a pretty shocking figure as well. And we can make choices on food choices, and uh, that's what we're here for today. Carolyn's got some more specific numbers, and I'm gonna turn it over to her. I will. Uh, there's three numbers here. The first one, what's your name? Michael. Michael, he's holding the one that says 300 on it. And Kristen is holding the one that says 1,200, and Dale is holding the one that says 4,000. So the one 300 is actually the number of gallons you use if you eat plant-based foods only in a day. In one day, 300 gallons of water. Um, and Kristen, the 1,200 is if you eat some eggs and dairy and 4,000 gallons is the last one, and that's if you eat uh, meat, if you eat meat, okay? Now I'm gonna add, that Dale kind of talked about this. Um, you know, she's mentioned that about 70%. Uh, Do you want us to stay up there? No, it's okay. That's good. Thank you, Thank you very much. I might ask you to come back here in a minute. Um, so, you know, obviously the water f footprint for um, if you eat a lot of animal foods is much higher. Now, why is that? Why is that? The grain and the water, the water that you have to use to grow the grain that's fed to the animals. Yeah. Because water flows uphill to money and you have to buy the legislature. <laughs> Did everyone hear that? Because water flows uphill to money, and you have to buy the legislature. <laughs> it, you know, the fact that uh, uh, the, as a protein source, of, of meat is so inefficient. You know, it's like seven to one the amount of protein you got to throw in to just get the cattle to the same you know, weight. So that, that's you, you, you've got a seven to one factor right there in efficiency that you're losing. It's actually worse than that. That's our. That's at least what Francis yeah. Said. Right, um, so uh, basically it's an inefficient way of eating food because what you're doing is you're feeding the food to the animals and they eat a lot more grain to produce a lot less meat. Um, and, and, and it's also true for other animals, but it's not, the inefficiency isn't quite as high. So I'm gonna just have my volunteers come up here again for a minute. Okay. <laughs> okay, you want to be the bad guy this time? <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've got, we're starting on this side with the corn. And, um, organic, of course. <laughs> non GMO, organic. So, corn, you have to have, uh, let's see, I think that's, 650 liters, you can turn it around, 650 liters for, um, of water for one kilogram of corn. And then when you get to poultry, it's 3,500 liters per kilogram of water. Um, for, 
of water per kilogram of food. And believe it or not, I couldn't even fit, fit kilograms uh, liters per kilogram. There wasn't room on the page, but 143,000 uh, liters of water for one kilogram. A kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So it's an amazing amount of water every time you eat a, uh, a hamburger. Oh, a liter is about a quart, isn't it? Yeah, a little more. A liter, a liter is about a quart, very close, 33 ounces versus 32, yeah. And so say something about the, uh, you hear a lot of figures on these, you hear a lot of, hear and see a lot of figures on, on these comparisons, and it has to do with how the research was done, where it was done, um, so you'll you'll see a lot of a lot of differences, but some re, some of the research doesn't include the water that was used to grow the feed to feed to the animals. Some of it you'll see is just what the animal uses while they're raising the animal. So if you see a really known, low number, that's why. Okay, thank you so much to Kristen and what did you say, Michael? Michael, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just want to go on here. So you know, obviously, the the biggest the biggest use of water is growing the grain to make the make the animals fat to make them juicy and plump and delicious. Okay. Um, So uh, let's see. I'm just going to move on here. So uh, the other the other aspect is the pollution of the water because you also have to use other inputs. You have to use a lot of more pesticides because most most food is not grown organically, and uh, so you have a much higher uh, negative impact on pollution of the water with eating high on the food chain, eating the animals. Um, and even eating the dairy and the eggs has a higher impact. Um, and that pollutes the rivers. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, um, believe it or not, beef, uh, the excrement is like uh, 130 times more than humans. So you have all that going, you know, a lot of that running into the rivers and running into the groundwater. It, it, it's just overall the impacts on pollution of water is also extremely high. In spite of that, it's very hard for us. You know, some people don't have the information. Even if you have the information, it's very hard to switch from a, uh, the diet we were all raised on, or most people were raised on, which is animal-based, to a plant-based diet. And I'm going to ask people to give me their input here. Why do you think it's so hard? Why is it hard to, just to switch? Advertising. Advertising. Price, salt and, sugar. salt and sugar, but we're talking about switching from a, a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet. Okay. They don't know which plants have adequate protein to substitute for the meat. Okay, but the, people don't know uh, enough about the protein issue, um, and I can talk. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, which where they're going to get the people are concerned about getting enough protein. Okay. Uh, it was did you have your hand up? No, I thought that was a great response. Okay, go ahead, Ann. It's, um, it's all about recipe and diet instruction. Re recipe. People, people don't know how to cook plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't taste as good. It doesn't taste as good. We're going to okay. change that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The dairy industry in particular has been adept over the years at clever commercials. They're in all the schools with information, information, disinformation, posters in classrooms about how we need dairy and uh, we don't need another mammal's milk beyond infancy. No mammal does. We're the only species on the planet that uses milk from another animal. Um, so 
So yeah, and uh, I want to say too, grass-fed is not the answer. We were talking a lot about grain, raising grain for animals, soybeans, alfalfa. Grass-fed is really problematic also. It, it puts wildlife at danger. It, just having more cows out there displaces wildlife, puts the wildlife in danger of being trapped, poisoned, to make room for yet more cattle. So this book, oh wait, wait, wait I, I, okay. I, I, okay, this, this book in particular is really, really good. It's brand new. Dr. Richard Oppenlander, full of information. I have it on the table up there. The title is Food Choice and Sustainability, and Carolyn first told me about it. Were you finished? I'm that? done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to pick up here on why it's, it's so difficult, uh, because it is. So, you know, it's, it's the kinds of things that people men mention, you know, what you're used to, your habit, what you were raised on. There's emotional attachments to food, right? Um, someone mentioned price. Actually, eating grains, um, you know, rice and beans is actually a lot cheaper than eating meat and cheese. Uh, but... Um, so I, I think there are some also some myths. The, the issue that you can't get your protein um, is actually a myth. If you eat a whole, grain, a whole food plant-based diet, you can get plenty of protein. I've been a, uh, a vegan for 28 years. I haven't eaten any animal products, and my body is not falling apart, and my cholesterol is pretty darn good. So, you know, it's actually a, a total myth. Uh, there's a lot out there on the Internet, and we can help you with resources. But I also wanted to mention one other aspect, which is that there's been a lot of research done on animal products, and it's actually, there actually uh, is a physical addicting process about animal pro uh, products. There's a book out by a wonderful uh, man. His name is Dr. Neil Bernard. People may have heard of him. He started a group called the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and they were actually the ones that pushed the, uh, I, I don't remember if it was the, I guess it was the USDA to change that, you know, the, the square pyramid. that we used to have for the dietary to a pyramid, which emphasized plant foods. And um, he has written a book called The Food Seduction, Breaking the Food Seduction. And there's actually, he has a talk on this on YouTube where he talks about uh, the research that's been done on the physical addictive properties of certain foods, including, unfortunately, chocolate, which is <laughs> my problem. But... <laughs> but... Uh, meat is addictive. So it takes a while, you know, it takes about a couple of months before the cravings go away. I just want to kind of tell you that because I think it's important to understand that a lot of times when people have cravings for foods, they feel it's because they need them. But as we all know, with addictions, it doesn't necessarily mean, and I'm not saying everybody who eats animals' foods is addicted. I'm just kind of pointing that out as something that most people are not aware of. Um... So I guess that's, uh, do you want? I have one last thing. I also, I, I think we need to consider the, in the USA alone, we bring in to being over 9 billion animals. That's billion with a B. We bring them to life and we feed and water them and we slaughter them totally unnecessarily. So I, I think that bears thinking about that the, the ethics of doing that for the animals themselves is, is big. I, I just want to make a couple of other comments, which, you know, we, we started out with a 300 for, uh, gallons per person per day and then uh, for vegan and then 1,200 for um, people who eat eggs and dairy and then 4,000 gallons per day for meat and you know you think well you know that couldn't make a difference but over the period of one year if I did the math right here uh, for someone who's a vegan then uh, a plant-based eater 
they eat about 110,000 gallons of water in their food. And for, uh, so 110,000 versus a million and a half gallons, it's a huge difference, you know, and when we're talking about scarcity, um, it, it, it is a significant, it does have a very significant impact on the water. Dale and I are both available to talk with people. We're gonna put a bunch of resources up on the web, uh, on the Braun website for you. Uh, where's the, where are the brochures? The brochures oh, are back there on a round table on top. Those are free to take and the, lots, of, um, lots of resources on those. And we are about to have a great lunch and I, I wanna thank, I don't see her right now, I think she's in the kitchen, Lynn and Kelly yes. helping me with lunch. A few more questions, okay. Go ahead. I, I won't be able to. I just, I want to um, offer one comment of support for what you're saying <coughs> from my experience. Most people think of making a change as all or nothing. And change is, is diet can be made one meal at a time, one meal a week, you know, or having three meals that are vegan or vegetarian a week and expanding that. So don't look at it as an all or nothing thing that you Great. can Go ahead, Ken. Oh, okay. It's changed. That's changing. But and you know, the at the actually the environmental working group has um, has some really good information on. Uh, you know, if you can't afford to eat organic, they have, you know, what the the best and worst uh, uh, conventional foods are in terms of the amount of pesticides, and you can go to their website, and, you know, there's a lot of conventional food that that you can, that, it, you know, is, is fairly good in terms of pesticides. Uh, but I just want to say one other thing is that, um, you know, vegan food can be very delicious. Uh, I mean, if you're like into really gourmet kinds of food, which I'm not, but Dale is, um, <laughs> I mean, I'll have soup and salad, you know, that's okay, but Dale will, will cook up all kinds of great, great things. But, and there's, literally, there must be hundreds of vegan cookbooks out there now. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you really like gourmet cooking and gourmet food and taste, because someone mentioned taste, uh, there's some delicious ways of cooking vegan food. And um, so, you know, it's not that you're going to have to suffer for the rest of your life. And it's actually quite, I find, I love eating it. It's very joyful. And, um, you know, it is a way of saving not only water, which is, water is such a remarkable thing. I mean, when you think about water, it's incredible. It's, you know, and we are, what, 75% water, 70% water ourselves. So, you know, if we can save water through reducing pollution, through using less water, if we can um, use less fossil fuels that they put into, you know, production of food, if we can help save the climate by changing our eating, even, you know, a little at a time, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thing. Um, and Dale, did you want to say anything more? Nope. No. No. <laughs> okay, we're going to have a great plant-based food. And oh, wait a minute! One other thing. This this woman came in today, and she left these these little things, and they're really quite lovely. They say love and gratitude for water. So if if you would like one or two of those, they're right up here. She said, put them by your faucet, and it will remind us about something we take to gr for granted every day. So thank you. Yeah, Kitty? Yeah, we got another question. Okay. Do like you know what? Very little food is grown with irrigated ag in Colorado and the United States, you know, percentage-wise. And I, and I saw your, your figures in there about, uh, you know, water, uh, corn does consume water. A bread basket is in Iowa and Illinois. It does consume water. But but that's coming out of the sky. And so, you know, and I suppose truthfully, you're using that much water, but you're not applying it or diverting it from the river. 
So I think you can tone those figures down a bit to actually what are we diverting off rivers and taking from someone else. And the other comment I had is, I don't think raising animals per se is, is unsustainable. The, the way we do it today, uh, where we grow corn in Iowa and ship it to really feedlots, not good, but animals do have a place on farms in a sustainable manner. And animals can eat things that we don't eat, like forage, and so they can be outside grazing. So they're, they're definitely a part of helping to feed people in the world. So uh, you know, my, my thoughts, if we didn't have animals and people can use them, we'd have a lot more malnutrition and uh, you know, starvation. Uh, you know, people might also say the opposite, though, which is because we put so much of our, you know, it's funny because this brings up why I became a vegan, a vegetarian 40 years ago. It was, do people know who Frances Moore LePay is? Yeah, in the 1970, I think she wrote a book called Diet for a Small Planet in which she talked about this issue of, you know, kind of converting plant foods into animals and the loss that you get there in terms of, of uh, usable food for all people. Uh, and there were some things in her book that were, have been proven to be wrong through research, but I think her basic point was, and I, you know, I, I, I'm sure we could, we could talk some more, and I, I don't know, I know, only know a small part of this, so I'm, it's not, but it, it, just to, to say something, the, um, I, which I was going to mention, the uh, UN uh, Environmental Program International Panel of Sustainable Resource Management came out, I think this was an article from 2010, in which they talked about, um, you know, the impacts of agriculture and um, that we really need, it's, it actually said we, you know, unlike fossil fuels, it's hard to look for alternatives, which I don't think is necessarily true, but they're, they're, they are saying that we do need to move away from animal products to be sustainable. But, you know, I think there's room to, to, to talk. The problem is that we can't eat the, I mean, people in this country eat an enormous amount of animal products, you know, three times a day. And there's just no way that you can produce that on small farms. That's why we have factory farms, because the demand is so high for them. So maybe some small amount of animal products, but not the way we do it now. Someone, Kitty, you wanted to say something? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, your taste buds do change. That's the thing. You're not going to suffer your whole life. Your taste buds do change. Um, go ahead. Well, hey. The nutritionists or the nutrition at schools that are paid for by the food industry, so they learn as nutritionists to recommend the status quo, the foods that are produced by the ag. Could people hear that? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, did you hear that? He's saying on your, you know, if you if you grow stuff in your own backyard, it's it's there are different there's differences, and we were really talking about commercial production. You know, if you have some backyard chickens that you're feeding compost, and you know that's that's probably all right. But again, it, it's 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 you know, and it and it's an independent decision that you have to kind of come to through your own looking at what you want to do. Kitty.
small amount of meat, and I believe in that. You know? mm -hmm. it's, it's just another choice. It's a choice that we could make it possible for us to, you know, to have a choice of meat or no meat. But you know, but what what the choice is right now is huge amounts that are subsidized, that make no sense, that are uh, that are contributing to you know to water tables that are. Did you hear that? Livestock raising is the number one cause of climate change. And that's not, we don't hear that very often. We don't hear that. So, thank you, Kitty. We, we will put a lot of these resources on the Braun website. Uh, we're going to work on that. If anyone has anything they can, in addition, they can send it to us. Uh, one, I'll mention two two videos that are good. A, a video called Plan Eat. P, it's like Planet, except it's Plan Eat. P L A N E A T. And uh, Forks Over Knives is a good video. And the person that Dale mentioned, Open Lander, has a very good talk on YouTube. Many talks on YouTube. There's so much great stuff on YouTube these days too. So 